Food in India is intricately tied to spirituality. The food we cook is often first offered to deities from a sacrificial goat in a Tamil or Bengali village to an urban person keeping rice and dal in front of the puja room before consuming it. The food we receive from temples is considered blessed. Food habits vary every 100 kilometers, just as religious rituals and beliefs vary. And yet there is a common mythological fabric underpinning our relationship to food. So in part two of my conversation with Devdat Patnaik, and I suggest you watch part one before watching this, I ask him a very simple question. What food did the gods eat? In all senses of the word, which kind of then brings me to my next question, which is sort of sequentially go through history, we get to the Vedic period, right? It's almost as if we moved from an urban mercantile system to a more pastoral agriculture and feudalistic yes. society, right? And the mythology and the stories, uh, the gods... Uh, are all fundamentally different. We don't quite know what the gods of the, the Indus uh, oh, time were, but of course, we now still live in times when we have this uh, completely continuous idea of you know Shiva and Vishnu, yes. Brahma, and, and the mythology that, that, that sort of defines the Indian subcontinent uh, in a sense. So I, I want to ask a very interesting question. As a mythologist, um, given that people tend to get very personal about their food and also very personal about what their gods ate, what did Shiva and Vishnu eat? <laughs> so, um, uh, see, Shiva and Vishnu's ideas are about 2,000 years old. Yes. Not before that. I mean, we can argue that they were 20,000 years ago. But as I said, that's your belief system and I respect that. But from data that we have, uh, it's about 2,000, 2,500 max. Uh, the idea of uh, Shiva and Vishnu. And what comes across is in this idea is a to understand Shiva and Vishnu, you have to understand Buddha. And it's really related to food in a way. Uh, because Buddhism and Jainism emerged uh, when the second urbanization took place in India. Yes. The Mahajanapadas after the Vedic period. And there was a lot of prof money being made. And we have Kashapanas being made, the coins. So I think there's so much of prosperity. Obviously, there's a lot of greed. There is a lot of jealousy. There is a lot of negative. You know, when money comes, they say yes. all kinds of problems also come. Yeah. And I think these monks emerged at this time who said, you know, the purpose of life cannot be about making money. Exactly. It's not about consumption. They went to the opposite end and they talked about monasticism. And that's the India's greater contribution to the world. We created the monastic orders, yes. which involved eat less. Consume less. Consume less. So everything is less. Like no uh, property, ownership. Really just so words own. like a parigraha emerges, do not own things, give it away, yeah, eat less, eat once a day. So the Jains would actually eat once a day, standing on one leg without utensils. So they created these rules of consumption which right. were like anti consumption. The funny thing is, none of them came from yeah. ordinary Working class survival class. Yeah. families, these were people who were rich, yeah, who they, could the word to kings. That, yeah. they could afford to do yes. that, and I think they had time to reflect on. The pleasures, they have obviously surrounded with a lot of wealth and power yeah. and pl pleasure. Women, music, dance. And they said there is something else to life. And I think that's the beginning of the idea. And this is in reaction to this monastic ideal. Hindus came up with an alternate idea. And I think I love this kind of a give and take of ideas which emerges. Right. Because then you have these two gods emerging called Shiva and Vishnu. Hara and Hari. Yes. Hara is the one who takes and Hari is the one who gives. Yes. So they sort of the create, balance each other. Creation destruction. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So um, what is the destruction over here? We use the word destruction, but it's not about, you know, when you say the word destruction, we think of uh, Terminator yes. and we think of things being broken. It's an American destruction. Yes. Indian destruction is when you don't have desire. So for example, if I destroy appetite, so that Shiva is the one who destroys your appetite, who destroys yes. your hunger. So that's the meaning of Shiva. Destroy appetite, destroy ego, oh. destroy many of those yeah. things. So all ego is an outcome of appetite. So from your fear, hunger, I mean, that's another conversation. Right. But if you look at purely from a food angle, I want to eat, so I consume. So every day I eat. Yes. But human beings start hoarding, hoarding, hoarding. That becomes the Yaksha Murti. So if you see some of the Buddhist stupas, there are these Yaksha Murti, big, large, misshapen, bejeweled men. Yes. So obviously with a lot of food. 
Then you have this fasting Buddha coming and saying fasting, and then Shiva coming and saying destroy hunger, and therefore he is covered with ash. Yes, he has burnt Kamadeva, the god of hunger, desire. Yes, so. Now there's no appetite left. So he's right. Mahadeva covered with ash sitting on the mountain. So, so the extreme Shiva devotees who then smear themselves with the ash, ash and also consume what would be very unappetizing food. Food. Right? Uh, so, raw so meat. Raw so. meal. Yes. So they are basically, they are eating because they are not Shiva yet. Yes. Shiva doesn't, will not eat will not at eat all. eat at all. That's the ideal state. That's yes. the ideal state. Yeah. But they're on the way. So they're rejecting cooked food, ready-made yeah. food. So what we call tamasic food. Yes. They'll eat in garbage. The Pashupatas would go into the crematorium and eat what is given necrophilia. to dead people. Necrophilia. Yeah. All kinds yeah. of things which normal human beings will not, not eat. Yeah. So it's a process of moving away. Yeah. The Jains would not eat anything at all. So yeah. they went to air. the air. Yeah. Like they actually talk yes. about these kind of things. So Shiva comes to that school of thought. And then the goddess comes into his life. And therefore Shiva is always shown with the God is saying that, you know, great, wonderful. You have done wonderful things. But what about the people around you? What about them? You have conquered your hunger, but these guys have not conquered their hunger. Should you feed them? This is where Hinduism comes up with this very interesting idea that it is not just about you. It is also about others. So while Shiva takes, Vishnu gives. gives. So you have Shiva in a way transforming into Vishnu. Yes. And so goddess becomes Annapurna, the provider of food. Yes. She's shown, as I said, uh, killing a buffalo. And I always say, why is Durga shown always killing a buffalo? Is it, uh, it is reminding you that food is the outcome of violence. You yes. will destroy nature in yes. order to produce food. All food is one f kind of cell, killing and eating another kind of cell. cell. Right? That's so fundamentally it. With the exception of milk and honey, this is just universally true. The yes. reason why milk and honey, therefore, were sacred foods, yes. because there's no violence in there's the no world, violence involved, yeah. in a way. I in mean, there way, is some yeah. uh, yeah. violence. Yes. But you see, this is a very, when you read the Brahmana literature and the Vedic literature, the old Vedic literature, this yeah. was the problem statement. Can I eat without killing? Yes. Because jivo jivatsya jivanam, if you yes. want to have Sanskrit. Yes. And suddenly it becomes what yes. you said, every cell yes. eats a cell. Yeah. And uh, this idea of life eating life, uh, and so there is a stories where you know a pigeon is being attacked by a eagle, yes. and uh, the king saves the eagle, yes. and uh, sorry, he saves the pigeon, and uh, when he saves the pigeon, the eagle says, "What will I eat?" Because my food is that. You've... Exactly. So dharma of protecting someone comes with dharma sankat, which is if I don't do violence, how will I feed? Yes, it is. A, it is a violence of another kind. kind. Right? It's it's violence that is in a sense. Separated from you because it's somebody else's problem, right? You you're not saddled with the moral uh, because the farmer is doing actually the slaughtering the animal. You know, I keep telling the you think the farmer is not killing animals. There are pests he's killing, worms he's killing. If you just go to a field, the amount of life that exists in the in that earth in which he's going to uh, push the plow. Right. Uh, you know the the amount of violence is there, and the pesticides and everything else that you have to use to prevent. Any other form of life other than that one plant. Plant. So agriculture is violence against violence. nature. But as animals, it is just naturally easier for us to see violence against a fellow animal as somehow being uh, morally more Moral. problematic. Than, so this is what yeah. the Hara Hari says. Yes. So what Hari does is he says, I generate the food, but not for myself. I do it for you. Yes. And therefore, they are trying to tackle hung greed. That I don't have to, I'm not going to be a yaksha. I'm not going to feed, I'm going to give you food yeah. and nudge you to do the same. So we really, it's this, this is the Indian ethos which has been forgotten right. where the purpose is to feed others. Yes. You're, so the prasad in a, a Shiva temple and a Vishnu temple, right? Yeah. You, you see this sort of pattern of this very elaborate richness that you see in a, in so, a Vishnu temple versus a Shiva temple. So... With Shiva, because he's a mendicant, yes. he doesn't eat cooked food. So they they would have given him nuts and fruits. And, you know, the milk which is poured on him yes. is raw milk, unprocessed, yes. pure raw milk, processed, uh, thrown at him. Because basically he's like, I'm not hungry. And you're literally offering him food saying that please respond yeah. to the day normal life. Vishnu is, on the other hand, enjoying himself. He is the best food, the yeah. best uh, clothes, the best music. So the quality of food is, you know, Naivedya is very important. Yes. Chappan Bhog. Yes. Because you eat literally eight times a day. So seven into eight is 56. So Chappan right. Bhog. Yes. So literally that's the mathematics. I'm like eight times a day. They'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the afternoon, he needs one snack. Yes. And, you know, you have got this a royal family will eat eight times a day. So I'm, I'm quite surprised and Puri temple is famous. Yes. All the Vaishnav temples are famous for the food. Yes. 
But what is interesting and what people do not tell, we get so trapped in the beautiful food that is being cooked, is Vishnu is not hungry at all. So why is the food being cooked? He's enjoying you feeding him. Yes. You are enjoying the process of that feeding him. That act of generosity. Generosity. Yeah. He's not hungry at all because he knows you're going to eat it. Yeah. It's for you. Yeah. You are not doing it for him. I keep telling people temple food is what you want to eat. Temple food is not what God wants to eat. Yes. God is not hungry. Yeah. He's and wanting you. Really, he's saying that, you know, you should outgrow hunger. Yeah. Ultimately, your purpose, that is why sannyasa or yeah. all the spiritual practices is about outgrowing hunger. Yeah. So while you, you are the great cook, yes. you know how to cook food, but you always do it for the other. Yeah. I'll give you an example. The yagya, we, we skip the Vedic period. Yes. But in the Vedas, which do not have Shiva and Vishnu, there is Pancha Mahayagya. Pancha Mahayagya is about feeding. You feed yourself, so you feed yourself, Brahma Yagya, yes. so you feed yourself. Yes. But then you feed your family and people who come to your house. And in India, we'll always do it with the right hand, moving it in our body, towards our body. Correct. Yeah. So that's the movement. Yes. You give it to the gods, so the stars, sky, yes. rivers. Yes. You give your ancestors, yes. all the people who made your life possible. Correct. And then your livestock. Yes. Because you have a cow. In those days, they were cows, cow so they would feed yes, the yes, cow yes, like correct, that. Yes. So if you look at your life, 20% is for you, 80% is for others. Others, yes. So it's about sharing. Yes. It's about feeding others. And that's a primary idea, which unfortunately we have forgotten. When we talk of yeah. Upanishads, Atma, Brahman and all that, all these Gurujis talk about, yeah. they never talk about generosity. Yes. About feeding others. Because in a, especially in a country like ours, where there's malnourishment, we don't want to deny hunger, but there is hunger. There's there poverty is. in our country. There's always been. There's always been. We've always been a... You've always been a very densely populated part of the world. In a, a lot of people in a small amount of land always. And always it's been, there have always been systems of exploitation. There's always been famine. famine. We've always been dependent on the monsoon. right? So you have these ideas like in the Manusmritis, Apad Dharma, which is emergency. So whenever there is a, fa whenever there is a yeah. uh, um, drought, They'll say, eat whatever you want. Yes. No the, rules. Yeah. No holes. So you have actually stories where Vishwamitra is probably going to eat. They don't complete the story because they don't want to deal with it. Yes. Uh, but he's eating a dog, yeah. Shwan, yeah. or which probably means the pig. Yes. Uh, 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 you know, so it's like he's come to the point where there's nothing else to eat. Nothing so he eats. To eat, yes. And this thing is apad dharma. It's okay. Yeah. Survival is more important Correct. than purity. It's more moral. Yeah, it's yeah. more moral to keep someone alive like. than to. Yeah. So these ideas are there. You know, you have the story of Trishanku where he... Uh, uh, provides beef to a starving family of Vishwamitra. Yes. And uh, of course the gods are upset and he says but they're starving and there's food. So there is you know these kind of a very beautiful yeah. wise conversations which are missing today. Nowadays you know we live in abundance. Yeah. We can say I will not eat this food. Yes. But when you have nothing to eat yeah. You eat what you eat and I think the scriptures are far yeah. matured and yes. I think nowadays So we have an abundance of food and a scarcity of imagination and tolerance. <laughs> We had That's a, a good shortage way. of food, food, but an abundance, abundance of, of imagination. imagination. That's a lovely, right? lovely way of putting it. Because that's, I think, as I think that's what the Buddha made the Buddha. Because he must have seen this yeah. in his time: yeah. abundance of food yes. and scarcity of imagination, yes. kindness, generosity. Which kind of then brought about these ideas, yes. right? And and again, it's, I think it's important people get very fundamentally close to those ideas as if they were just the absolute truth. That's never been the case in the Indian subcontinent. We have. Like we eat a thousand things. There's a thousand ideas. And you can hold three contradicting ideas in your head at any point of point time. Up. And uh, one beautiful analog I wanted to point out in the food science uh, world, right, is that this concept of hara hari and the idea of generosity and the idea of the God enjoying your generosity. Um, there's an interesting parallel where have you, if you've noticed, people who cook food very rarely enjoy eating, eating. the food. Yeah, cook. I've heard this. Um, and it's not some spiritual thing at all. It's because 80% of flavor perception is aroma. right? It's not taste. It's not anything else. And unfortunately, your olfactory receptors get acclimatized, meaning that if you're repeatedly stimulating them, you don't smell those. You don't get triggered in your brain anymore. right? So if you're in the kitchen cooking that biryani, cooking that dal, etc., etc., those flavor molecules are already pre-saturating you. So you are not going to enjoy that food as much as someone who just walked into your house, a weary traveler who you are feeding. Uh, and for flavors. that person, it is just this insanely hundred times more intense experience than for you living in that house. So in that sense, mm. right, we're literally uh, designed 
to be generous with food, food. as opposed to you know, uh, you know just to be, make food just for us to enjoy ourselves. this yeah. point is brought out yeah. in the mahabharata in a very beautiful way because bhima is supposed to love eating food he loves to eat food and uh, one of the stories which upset some people is that when his mother would prepare food 50% of the food should keep for bhima because he ate more yes and the other brothers would get smaller pieces and that's one of the reasons why the kauravas didn't like him because he ate a lot yeah but when he goes to the uh, you know virata parva when he's in his exile what he's made to do is be a cook yes you know vallabha yes. and he's cooking and it's very interesting that the vyasa when he's writing the story he's dealing with a very psychological issue here is a man who loves food yes during his punishment he is being told you will cook and feed food and you and as a cook the tradition is that you don't eat till everybody is fed yes this idea that i'm imagining a bhima who is used to prince and he's surrounded by luxury and everybody feeds him and he loves to eat yeah. his you know his wives feed him everybody feeds him yes. is being told okay one year you're going to feed only other people and when they are happy you will eat yes and i think that's a balancing act yeah, you know yeah. you know when yes. you're the consumer yeah. is being told that you should give food yeah and you know the, the or the story of draupadi which is draupadi's thali and it's a story which uh, the surya gives her the thali and says what are, this will always be full of food people come to your house you can keep feed them when everybody has been fed if you, the moment you eat the food it will stop producing food that day at that point yes so as long as there's a hungry person so even today in kerala there are temples where they will before they shut the temple kitchen they will say is there anybody hungry have you eaten yes and i think draupadi would do that because imagine if you eat food and then suddenly a hungry person comes to your house because now there's no food in the house and i think these ideas which i don't find in other religions i read mythologies around the world yes the closest i find is a folklore in the persian arab and the jewish tradition is when rebecca would travel there would always be a cloud on top of her so yeah. there's always shade yes. but when you enter her house there's a lamp burning and there's always warm bread yes so i think the mother goddess and feeding and kitchen is part of all cultures but in india it takes an exception it anna brahman food is god it's god yeah, absolutely and i think that idea that it, it's a metaphor for everything right yes. it's a metaphor for everything and i think that is so important naivedya prasad you know ahuti everything's food 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 yeah, yeah i think that should be the name of this podcast series <laughs> food is god right <laughs>